Thank you, uh, everyone, for, for being here. Thank you. Go oh, first. thank you, Jeff. No, no, thank you. No, no. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so enjoy to, my time with you. I, yeah, I, not, not more than I enjoy with you. Um, <laughs> welcome to the People's Republic of Aspen, by the way. Um, you're going to have a great time tonight. Oh, I always These do. people lean so far to the left, it's almost right. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, uh, it makes a loop. No, it doesn't. Everybody's fine. We're all centrist. Is the feedback too. bothering you? What? The feedback? Yeah, the feedback. Can we do something on the feedback, guys? That'd be helpful. Don't, don't make him angry. That's all I can yeah. tell you. Just don't. Let's just start off on a bad foot here. Don't make him angry. I think we already did. Um, Governor Christie. Chris, sorry. Whatever uh, you like, no, Jeff. I, yeah. Um, so we're going <laughs> to gonna talk for a while, and then uh, we're going to take some questions from the uh, audience. Paul Ryan didn't take questions from the audience, but of Chris course. Christie It's is from Wisconsin. <laughs> What does that even have to do with anything? Because Seriously. people from Jersey take questions. Yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> so let me, um, let me jump in. And, and the reason that we were joking a little bit before is that we've known each other a, a while. Uh, we've done this before. It usually devolves into sort of like drive time sports radio uh, <laughs> with a lot of cursing. Um, and a lot of Springsteen references, yes. and, and just becomes pretty unpleasant. So you're going to watch that become unpleasant. Congratulations. Program. Yeah. The, um, the, uh, so let's, let's, just start, um, let's just start with where you are politically now. And uh, we'll, get to the, uh, we'll get to the issue of the vetting, the documents that just came out in a moment. But um, what I think a lot of people want to know is what you see in Donald Trump that other people don't see. <laughs> and that was a serious question. Yeah, no, listen, first of all, I've known him for 17 years. So my, my perspective on him is a bit broader than, than most people's is. But let me start off by saying this. Elections are not about who you want to vote for. Elections are about who's left to vote for. <laughs> and so to be clear, Donald Trump was not my first choice for president. I was. <laughs> And I, you know, I was at a conference a few weeks ago on, in, in Jeff's old haunts on Long Island, and David Stern, the former NBA commissioner, you know, stood up and said he was going to save my soul and list all these things that he doesn't like about Trump, and, and when are you going to finally stand up, he said to me. And I said, I ran against it. <laughs> I mean, like, the, the single greatest thing that you can do in a democracy to show that you are opposing something is to run and to try to beat that person. You're not always going to be successful, and I wasn't. What, what I decided in 2016, after I got out of the race, was I saw Donald Trump come in second in Iowa, win New Hampshire by two to one margin in a field of 16 people, and then win South Carolina the next week by 10 points. Now, anybody else who ran that way would have been declared by the media right at that moment as the nominee. You did that well in Iowa. You won New Hampshire two to one. You won South Carolina by double digits. So my wife, Mary Pat, is here with me, and I sat on the couch that night. And I said, well, at that time, we had been friends with them for 15 years. I said, here's our choice. We either sit on the sidelines or do nothing. And he's going to be the nominee no matter what. It's over. No matter what anybody thinks, he's the nominee. None of these other guys can fight him. And we can try to make him better. Yeah. All right. Fine. Right. That, so yeah. and so, I'll finish it. Yeah. And then I'll. And then, then the I'll election. Then the election it. comes down. You can correct me all you want. No, You'd I be will. Be wrong. But I will. You'll be fine. The the <laughs> the election comes down to Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. I simply and I would do the same thing today. Because of the way they both approach issues, I would not vote for Hillary Clinton. I would vote for Donald Trump. Now. This election was one where the, the, the post-election polls tell us that 20% of the people who voted didn't like either one of them. 20% of the people who voted. Forget about what the people who never didn't show up thought. So this was a very odd election. I went with my philosophical approach to it, which was I agree more with him on the issues than I agree with her on the issues. He's not my first choice. I was. But he's the guy who's nominated. We've got two people to choose from. I'm with him. Let me ask you this, though, because 
what you decided in 2016 is one thing. What we know now in 2019 is something else. There's no learning curve. It doesn't get better. The behavior doesn't get better. Well, the erratic you, quality. Sure. And you know from doing from 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 being fired from doing the the transition. Right. You know what kind of a I'm just going to say it rolling shit show the whole hiring process was. Right. Uh, what's how could your opinion not change between the election and now, no, given listen, what you've seen? Because he's no different. No, so, so Jeff, like, you know, people like act shocked about the tweeting and the outbursts and the and you know the the sense of of uh, it's entitlement. Well, hell, man, I watched the campaign. That's him. Okay, so he's not changing. But what has happened from a Republican's perspective is that we've had tax reform, that we have lesser regulation, that we have economic growth, that we, that, you know, he's done things that Republicans want to see done in the country. I understand that Democrats don't want that, but they lost. So, so, so if he's doing, I don't agree with everything he does, and you know full well that when, and you've heard it and we've talked about this, when I don't agree with him, I say it. And I'm sure we'll get to some of those things tonight. But you're starting off with the broad generalized question. And the broad generalized question can only be answered in the context of elections. And if the 2016 election were held again tomorrow, I'd vote for him again. Can someone be so egregious that you simply sit it out in protest? I don't think that's what democracy is about, no. I think people who sit it out um, might as well just not even be American citizens. Our job is to make a choice. You don't like the system, go out and try to change the system. But, you know, there are plenty of people who felt the same way about Hillary. And so, you know, no, I don't think sitting it out is an acceptable option because our democracy is based on people participating. And so, our democracy will fail when people stop participating. So he here's the thing. Uh, and so, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Known you and covered you for a long time. Yep. I know that during your when you were governor, there was an incident um, in uh, not an incident. A, a Muslim American was nominated for a judgeship. I nominated him. You nominated. He wasn't him. just nominated. Well, it I was, nominated. Uh, all right, fine. <laughs> wasn't like it just happened. <laughs> I did it. Let me use my passive aggressive no, circumlocution. No, please, no, 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 no. If right, we're going to talk about right. this, you, I nominated the dude. You, I did it. Great hero of the Muslims, Chris Christie, for, nominated hey, him. By fine. the way. Fine. And you know what? First, first Muslim American judge ever appointed and to by the state the way, of New Jersey. Not John Corzine, that liberal hero, or Jim Flair, or anybody else. They didn't and appoint by the a way, Muslim. As I they did. say in Mecca, Muzzle Tough. I mean, Ex no, really. I wanna, I, I wanna. No, Salam and, Malaika, and, my friend. And I'm giving you, and I'm giving you the credit. Okay. So you weren't. I took it. Well, <laughs> I'm now seating you. I'm ceding the credit to you. Thank you. No, no, I brought it up. Thank you. I brought it up, Go giving ahead. you the opportunity to yeah. take the credit. Fine. We're going to go to commercial and then uh, we'll reset this. Uh, Donald Trump, during the campaign, attacks a Gold Star family, Muslim American family, raises all kinds of nefarious questions about this family that, that, whose son is a hero. At that point, I, I guess the question is, I mean, this is what I think a lot of people look at sensible mid-Atlantic moderate Republican governor who does these things. And by the way, the, the, the full New Jersey story, the full story of that judge, is that there was a lot of pushback. There was national pushback from, from various right-wing groups that said, this guy's a secret Muslim brotherhood, whatever. And, and you very rambunctiously said, leave him alone. This is my guy. And I'm tired of dealing with the crazies. Yeah. It, so, so you look at Donald Trump. Do you, right. do you disagree with the assessment that Donald Trump is anti-Muslim? Do you disagree with the assessment that he behaved in a heinous way toward that Gold Star family? Right, let me ask this, answer the second one first. I absolutely think that what he did with the Gold Star family was wrong, and I told him that. And I said it publicly. And I was the one who was called in by his family when they couldn't get him to stop talking about them and said, you've got to convince him to knock this off. Wait, tell us that story. So, uh, incredibly, Jared Kushner um, <laughs> calls me and says, listen, we need your help. He's, he's, you know, off the rails on this con stuff, and I think he'll listen to you. And I said, all right. So I just show up unannounced at Trump Tower, and I walk into his office, and he said, what's up? I said, we need to talk. And he said, about what? I said, let me sit down. And I said, so I'm... <laughs> I'm confused. So what are you confused about? 
I said, I thought we were running against Hillary Clinton. And he said, we are. And I said, no, 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 no. We're running against the cons. Because all you're doing is talking about the cons. And I said, and if, that's, if, if we're actually running against the cons, I'm out. Because we're going to lose then. And I have no interest in you know, helping you lose. You got to think differently about this. He said, what do you mean? This guy said awful things about me. He got on the stage, said terrible things about me, said I never read the Constitution, this, that, that. I said, you're right. He said a lot of awful things about you. I said, but here's what you've got to remember. He did something that you and I pray every day we never will have to do. He gave his son for this country. And you and I are both fathers. We both have children that we love dearly. And we would never want to lose one of our children, ever. And I said, you know what that gives him permission to do? He said, what? I said, whatever the hell he wants. And that's it. And after that conversation, you did not hear him talk about the cons again. Now, I don't know whether I was providing any service to the country. I don't know whether that would have been better if I hadn't been around and had been sitting it out, um, you know, holding my breath in my living room in New Jersey. I happen to think that I made it better. And, and it doesn't mean that, you know, when, he, when I was running against him and he said we should have a Muslim ban, I said, that's ridiculous. And I came out and I said, it's wrong. It's, it's absolutely anti what this country is about. And I wouldn't support it. So, you know, I think the idea is when you have the ability to influence someone, you, that also means you take some but risk. Chris, it's a lovely story, but he hasn't become... He hasn't changed his fundamental view I of, among other mo mo things, Muslims, Mexicans, and so on. I, but Jeff. I mean, you gave him a tactical out, but you didn't actually. You gave him a tactical out. I told him that he was wrong and that those people had the right to say whatever they wanted to say. That's not tactical. That's the truth. I told him the truth. He heard the truth, and he stopped. Now, you know, I can't change somebody who has been who they are for 73 years every minute of the day. But if I can change him in a positive way for an hour a day, that's a positive. Well, let me ask you this, and we're going to come to your favorite subject of the Kushner family in a minute. Uh, <laughs> so hold on to your seats. But, uh, but, but give me other examples of, 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 of an area in which Donald Trump has grown in office or where you have helped oh, well, on the learning curve. Well, forget about me. It's not about me helping on the learning curve. I think, um, I think what you just saw um, with Iran on the issue of the military strike is something that he would not have had the guts to do, uh, whether you agree with it or not, he wouldn't have the guts to do that 18 months ago, 24 months ago. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. When Obama did the same thing on the red line, you didn't praise him for his guts. Hold on. No, 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 wait a second. That's an absolute... I'm not saying I agree with the policy. I don't, by the way. I don't agree with what the president did. I would have allowed the strike to go on if I was president. But I think it says something about him that he thought about it, and he changed his mind, and he was not scared to execute on that no matter who was going to criticize him for it. That's growth. That's growth for anybody in a leadership position to have taken a position and feel as if, you know what, I might be wrong about this. I'm having second thoughts, so instead of just doing it, and denying I have second thoughts, he said, no, stop it. And, and so I think in, in the same way that I disagreed with Obama drawing a red line and then not enforcing it, I don't agree with Trump doing that because I think it sends a bad signal to the Iranians. But you asked, not that question, you asked about an example for his personal growth. And I don't think that's something that he would have done in January of 17. I think he would have just let it happen and then rationalized it afterwards, even though he had misgivings. I think that shows some growth from a leadership perspective for, for him, and I think it's the most recent example of it. Let me ask you this as a supporter of the president. Uh, there are four, somewhere between 14 and 22 women, including a new uh, allegation in the last few days, um, that Donald Trump has uh, assaulted them, sexually harassed them, all the way up to, to rape. What do you think of these accusations? I don't know what to make of them. I mean, you know, the, the, the bottom line Do you think is, any of them are credible? Do I think any of them are credible? 
listen, I think a couple of them may be credible, but I don't know that they're true. And, and I'm not going to defend that. Listen, what, what does it mean? Well, let me tell you from a prosecutor's perspective what that means. That someone, you could listen to someone's story and say, some people you listen to and you go, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. That story doesn't hold together. Other people who have a credible story, you say, you know what? That could be true. It could be true. And then the job is to then ferret out the facts and prove whether it's true or not. I, I'm sorry, I have the disease of a prosecutor. That's the core of my career, and that's the way I think. Would you call so, for a comprehensive investigation of Donald Trump and these 14 uh, no, because to 22 be, women? Because, the, because as a practical matter, the statute of limitations on all of them is gone. But it's a moral question, too. Well, no, it's but, not just... But listen, prosecutors, investigators, aren't there to, in, to enforce moral code. They're there to enforce... I'm not the, asking you as a Jeffrey, prosecutor. I'm asking Jeff, you as a politician yeah, and as a leader well, in the country. But what's this comprehensive investigation? Who's doing it? A serious investigation? I don't Who's know. Doing you figure it? Somebody well, do it. Who? I don't know. I'm not, well, I'm not well, uh, yeah, pointing people. Don't ask a stupid question It's not like a stupid that. question. I it think is. it's a serious question. It is a stupid well, question, because, a stupid because, question? Because people who investigate in our system of government are prosecutors. That's who investigate. The FBI, state-level law enforcement, and then prosecutors make decisions about whether to bring cases or not. Why should those folks go through an exercise to investigate when at the end, the prosecutor can say to them, might be a good case, but the statute of limitations expired 15 years ago. That's a waste of time, a waste of money. Let me rephrase and the question. Do you want to know the truth about I always want. I always want to know the truth. But you know what? I don't believe we're ever going to know the truth. Because these things have happened many years ago, if there's a new atmosphere and era in our country now where people are willing to speak out where before they weren't, that's a great thing. And, and as a father of two daughters, I think women should speak out immediately when these things happen. That was not the culture before. So these women are now in a situation, like the woman who just recently came out, that this is an incident that happened 20 plus years ago. The problem with that is it's very difficult to definitively, or even beyond a reasonable doubt, prove things that happened 20 plus years ago beyond a reasonable doubt. And so do I want to know the truth? Of course I'd like to know the truth, Jeff, like anybody else would like to know the truth. But I don't think we can find the truth in these instances under these circumstances. I don't think you can. The same way you can't find out the truth about Bill Clinton and the, the women who made allegations against him. You know, you, you're just not going to be able to find out the truth of that. And, and but for a dress, we would have never found out about the, the stuff with Monica Lewinsky. And, and I would have the same answer about Bill Clinton that I have about Donald Trump. It doesn't matter. This is not a partisan issue. This is about what, what does our system permit us to do. And by the way, everybody in this audience should cling to that because it could be you next. And this system is set up to make sure that we provide justice. And justice sometimes is having to walk away from things because you can't prove it or the law prevents you from doing it. Let me, I want to come back to this, but I want to ask you, I want to, I want to reframe a question to you. You know Donald Trump better than probably anyone in this room. I'm going to make that assumption. Maybe I think that's a, a safe assumption. assumption. I don't know. You never know. I think it's uh, a safe assumption. No, let's not. We're not going to take a poll. Um, <laughs> but what do people... You obviously see something in him that other people don't. You see, don't, you see, you, you I don't see, know why you think that. He pursues, because you told me that. No, he pursues. No, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't say that. You, I see you, stuff. You've told me you no, see I, positive no, qualities. No, I, in him. Well, well, I no, no. I said that I understand him in a way that others don't. Okay, that's, because of the length of my relationship with him. Then go. So what, what don't people understand? What are people missing in this in this mystery? Oh, you know, I mean, listen, and you can Jeff, even talk about it in relationship to the voters too, the people who voted for him. Well, I think it's pretty clear that the people who vote, I'll give you an example of, of what the voters were thinking when they looked at Donald Trump. And it's an example that involves my wife. When we were campaigning in New Hampshire, Mary Pat was going door to door for me on a regular basis. And one day she went up to a door of a Republican voter. They opened the door. It's an older woman. And she says, hi, my name is Mary Pat Christie. And she said, oh, are you the governor's wife? She said, yeah. She goes, come in, come in. So we, this is a positive sign. So you, she goes in <laughs> and she said, oh, Mary Pat, we love your husband. He is so bright and articulate and direct. I mean, we're voting for Trump, but we love your husband. <laughs> and, and, and we hope that Trump makes him vice president or attorney general. And my wife says 
to the woman, can I ask you a question? If you think Chris is bright and articulate and direct, why are you voting for Trump? And she grabbed Mary Pat's arm, rubbed her arm, and said, oh dear, we don't need another politician. Now, what people saw in Donald Trump who voted for him was they saw a dysfunctional Washington, D.C. that they didn't believe were addressing their lives, their concerns, their problems. They were sick of politicians in both parties. They had, were tired of George Bush. They were tired of Barack Obama. They let the Republicans control the Congress for a while. They didn't like that. They let the Democrats control it for a while. They sent it back to the Republicans. And they're like, none of this works. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to vote for a guy who doesn't care about Republicans or Democrats, who doesn't give a damn about Washington, D.C., and who is brash enough and who is untethered enough to go down there and throw the table over and break all the China. I don't think it's a lot more complicated than that. All right, Donald Trump, I stood on a, on a, on a, on a debate stage with Donald Trump in, at the Reagan Library when um, he was asked a question about the nuclear triad. And I was standing next to Jeb Bush. And as we listened to Trump's answer, Jeb looked at me and said, oh my God, he doesn't know what the nuclear triad is. <laughs> and I said, no, he doesn't. And, it, and if it was obvious to me and Jeb, it was obvious to everybody who was watching. They don't care. They don't care. They figure there'll be people who know what the nuclear triad is. And that doesn't frighten is. the shit out of you? Now listen, uh, you know what? To some extent, yes, <laughs> right? But also, I also understand, as do you, that there are mechanisms of our government that have been there for so long and that are so entrenched that there, it's, a, it's a myth that a president can do whatever he wants. And, and so one of the things, and I think the biggest thing, that people didn't understand about Trump in the lead up to the election, whether it was the media or pollsters or, 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 or just commentators in general, was that he represented something. I didn't understand it. Jeff, I didn't get it. I thought, well, he can't win. Come on. He hosted Celebrity Apprentice. <laughs> We're not going to vote for the guy who hosted Celebrity Apprentice. I was wrong because people were so disgusted with what they saw as a Washington, D.C. that didn't work for them. And he, has, and he has followed that path since. He believes that's what got him there, and he's going to continue to follow that path until that path ends. And so, you know, to me, what I see in him um, from that perspective was somebody who was insightful enough to see that in the voters and read it, and no one else did. No one did. And he gets some credit for that. He deserves credit for that. Because nobody else thought when he came down the escalator on June 15th of uh, 2015 that he was going to be president of the United States. I mean nobody, including him. I have to correct you on one thing. What's that? Presidents do have power, unilateral power, to do a lot of damage. They I, do. I they said, absolutely, they well, have, he can, he can they start a war tonight if he wants. And I, the president and, and, could. Of course. And that's but, what... And that's the, the, the system's failure. The, the, I didn't say that a president didn't have strong unilateral power. What I said was, there is a myth that a president can do whatever he wants. That's different than a president has strong unilateral Of course a president has strong unilateral power. And we've seen that over and over again from Republican and Democratic presidents, who all of whom in my lifetime have acted in warlike fashions without the authority of Congress. Every one of them, going back to John Kennedy, who was president when I was born, to Donald Trump, who's president today, every one of them, has taken aggressive military action and put American lives at risk without Congress's authority. So that's the way it's always been. And I've told people. So you I don't think, see Trump as a disruptive, or you see him as part of a continuum? I, in, that, in, in that limited sense, yes. He is a disruptor in many other ways. But in that limited sense, and I think the Iranian thing is a perfect example of that, Jeff. Uh, people have said to me all the time, don't charge your afraid he's going to get us in a war. I say, no. In fact, Quite the opposite. I don't think he wants anything to do with it. I don't think he wants anything to do with that stuff. I really don't. And, and I don't think that's what he ran for president for and what he wants to try to accomplish when he's there. And so I think we're at a much lower risk of being involved in war with him than we are with some other folks who had a different attitude and approach to it. Let me, let me ask you this. If there were no tweeting, and if there were orderly personnel processes in the White House. Two big ifs. But very big ifs. If those things were different, um, would this presidency, in your mind, be normal? 
No, because he, he, he will never be a normal politician. But the presidency would be on way to a landslide reelection. And the reason, in my view, that it's close and he may lose is because of his temperament, is because of the awful set of people that he's had around him. And, you know, th that's just unavoidable. That's Who's un the most awful? <laughs> we have all night. Nobody's need, they don't yeah, need listen, room That's, after, that's yeah. tough. But like, I, my personal favorite awful is Mike Flynn. And, you know, when the, pre when the president started to get um, his intelligence briefings, which started in June or so of 16, when he became the nominee apparent, um, the director of national intelligence called me as the director of the transition to set up these intelligence briefings, said he can bring two people with him. So I went to Trump and said, you know, you're going to start these briefings. You can bring two people with you. Who do you want to bring? And he said, I want to bring you and Mike Flynn. And I had known Flynn a little bit before that, but not that well. I can't talk about what was discussed in the intelligence briefings, but what I can tell you is his performance was appalling. Flynn's. And every time we'd come out of one of those briefings, I'd say to Trump, you got to get rid of this guy. He's a train wreck. He's awful. And, and it culminated in the day after the election, after I ran my first transition meeting post-election, I went up to his apartment to brief him on it. And I said, listen, one of the things you, don't, you shouldn't do is offer any jobs to anybody until you pick a chief of staff. The chief of staff should be involved in all of those decision-making things. He goes, well, I already offered somebody a job. And I said, who? And he said, I offered the national security advisor. I said, oh, please tell me that you didn't <laughs> offer it to Mike Flynn. And he said, I did. I said, Mr. President-elect, I just want to say for the last time that this is an awful, awful mistake. And this guy is completely ill-tempered to be the person who serves as the conciliator between the State Department, the Defense Department, and the intelligence community to coalesce that information and bring it to you in digestible fashion. He cannot do it. And he said, you just don't like him. And I said, you're right, I don't. You want to know why? And he said, yeah. And I said, because he's going to get you in trouble. So, you know, but the, the, the dysfunction goes a lot deeper than. Well, of course, well, you asked me for my most favorite. Yeah, well, then, then let's worst keep person. going. <laughs> well, listen. I mean, I don't. You know, uh, let me. Let Tom, me. Uh, Tom, uh, yeah. Tom Price at HHS, um, Pruitt at EPA. Um, uh, what's her name? The, the the one from The Apprentice Show. Um, Amarosa. Amarosa. What the hell is Amarosa doing in the White House? <laughs> I, I mean, seriously. Like, she was not on any vetting list that we put together for him, right? Um, Omarosa. And, and, and I think that, you know, you go, Reince Priebus shouldn't have been chief of staff. I know Reince for a long time. I think he's a very nice guy and a very effective national chairman. But he had no experience to be chief of staff. Steve Bannon didn't belong anywhere in the White House. Does Jared Kushner belong in the White House? Uh, not on his merits, no. He's a 35-year-old real estate guy. No, on the merits, no. When you told Trump this, what did he say? Well, I, I never told Trump that. What I told Trump was that he should not give his family any official jobs. The family can always be, and will always be, in every administration, informal advisors. And you're gonna be able to get the benefit of their advice. But once you give them a job, it does two things. One, it puts your family in the political crosshairs in a way that you're not gonna be willing to tolerate because you love them and you don't want to see them attacked and that's what's going to happen for people in official jobs. That's the way Washington works. I said, secondly, you're going to cripple the rest of your staff because everyone's going to walk around on eggshells in front of them and not want to disagree with them in front of you because they know they get to go up to the residence after work's over and get to have the last word. And so staff won't be effective for you. So I didn't make it personalized to Jared because I think that any family members shouldn't have official positions in the government of the president because of those two issues. But you think he's otherwise competent or otherwise incompetent, regardless of the fact that he's I, a family No, member? I answered that question first. I said, on the merits, he does not belong is there. Is he incompetent? At what well, I don't know. Listen, you know, the, the fact of the matter is I haven't worked with him enough to say whether he's incompetent. He's certainly a bright person. 
I've had enough interaction with him to know he's not dumb. He's smart. He's a smart guy. But that's not all you need to be effective at that level in the White House. You need experience. You need some savvy. You need to have been beaten around a little bit and understand how to get up off the ground. I mean, there's a whole bunch of assets that you need if people at that high a level we're going to be three doors down from the president. Describe for everyone what happened in the vetting process and why it went south. Well, I mean, without going into morbid detail, <laughs> I was asked by the president to be the chairman of the transition in May of 16. I left the campaign and went full time on the transition. Put together a team of 140 people, mostly volunteers, working in Washington, D.C to put together an entire plan for an administration, from personnel to executive orders to white papers on all the topics that he had talked about in the campaign and topics that were going to be left over by the Obama administration. And at the end of that process, um, we presented him on the day before the election with 30 volumes of material um, on all of those topics, including having vetted um, four potential nominees for every cabinet position and every senior position at the White House. And those, that vetting was done by 10 former United States attorneys from the Bush 43 administration who did it on a volunteer basis, because I called and asked them to do it. And so he had a great thing in front of him. Two days after the election, I was fired. And they And that was Jared, you think? Well, I only know that because that's what Steve Bannon told me. Steve Bannon is the person who actually fired me. Um, but when pressed, he said, listen, it's the kid. He's been taking an ax to your head with the boss ever since I got here. So I don't know it was Jared. I've been told by the person who terminated me that it was Jared. And it makes sense. Um, so it's OK they fired me. That's fine, I'm one person. But they threw out all the work, literally. Took the 30 volumes and threw it in a dumpster and started over with 72 days to go to the inaugural. So if you're wondering why, I think the phrase you used was rolling shit show, which must be a special Long Island phrase. But if you're wondering why it, it, it ended. We're classy on Long Island right, yeah, here in Jersey. And, yeah. you know, that it ended the way it, it has evolved the way it has. You can't ever come back from that. You cannot ever come back from that because there's not enough time. Well, you had great, you had Jim Mattis, you had other people. Well, listen, I'm not saying there weren't good people there, and, and there are. I mean, I think Rex Tillerson was good. I think he was the wrong choice because the president had no relationship with him. And you can't have a situation where the president has no personal relationship with the Secretary of State. I think we understand that one. But can you describe from your vantage point what happened to Jim Mattis? Jim this is a very, very relevant question this week with everything that's yeah. going on with Iran, obviously. Jim Mattis had significant policy differences with the president, and he decided to leave. I don't think it was any more complicated than that. And I, and I, I saw Secretary Mattis. Is the president incapable of taking constructive or constructive criticism or dissent? No, I, I've seen him take dissent, and I gave you the example of the, of the cons, and I could give you a number of other examples where he will listen to that stuff. I think they just came to loggerheads. I think Mattis wanted him to go right, and he wanted to go left, and then he's the one who's elected, so he leaves. I don't think it was any more complicated than that. I think that the relationship was one that deteriorated over time because those differences became starker. And so as a result, I think when Mattis finally got to the point that he did on the Iranian issue, he just finally said, well, I can't do this anymore because my counsel is not valuable to you. And so we so fundamentally disagree that I need to leave. And I think that's, I think that's exactly what happened with Mattis. And I think Mattis deserves a lot of credit for you know, recognizing that and not just holding on to the job and recognizing that the president has a right to make these decisions. He made them, and, and he disagreed, so he left. Let me ask you about 2020. What would the Democrats have to do to win? Um, I'll give you a, a micro answer and a macro answer. On the micro side, they need to nominate someone who can persuade those 77,000 voters 
in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania who won the election for the president. Uh, it's 77,000 votes in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And those voters are predominantly, although not exclusively, white working class men and women. Um, if they nominate someone who cannot appeal to those people, they won't win. Do you think Joe Biden is that guy? I think he's the best of the lot of the 25 to, to do that, yeah. Because he's from there, he speaks that language, he understands their particular um, concerns, I think, to a great extent, and I think he can articulate them. So I think, I think Biden is the most dangerous opponent of the group for the president as we sit today. But I'll give you, the macro answer is, I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because you've got 25 people, 23 of whom have never been on the national stage. Only Joe and Bernie have been on the national stage. And so you don't know what they're gonna do. I, I could tell you like, for instance, like Scott Walker at one time was like the front runner in Iowa. He literally sweated himself off the, off the, out of the campaign at the Reagan Library debate. <laughs> Couldn't answer, was sweating profusely, what, wasn't ready. Now, you, now, this is a guy who's faced up to unions in, in Wisconsin to put up with a lot of very difficult issues, whether you agree with them or disagree with them. No one could have predicted that Scott wouldn't perform in that circumstance, but he didn't. What happens when these lights go on in a presidential race, and they're a thousand times brighter than these lights, is there's only two options. You either shine or you melt. That's it. And if you shine, it doesn't mean you win. It means you survive. It's like Survivor. You get to stay on the island for another week. <laughs> That's it. If you melt, the whole country sees it. You know it. a lot of these people. Which one do you think, since we're just talking, just us, which one do you think is going to melt this week? Which one do you think is going to shine? Listen, I will tell you this. I think... And I've said this for weeks before this. I said it on Stephanopoulos' show about two months ago. Short Pete Buttigieg. Short him. Because he's not ready for prime time. And if you watched what happened in South Bend in the last couple of days, I, you know, it was an awful performance. An awful bit of leadership on his part. And he's going to get up there on that stage, and he's going to look very young. Very young. So I think that Buttigieg will be a melter. Um, you know, there's so many of them that, like, they won't even melt. They'll just never even appear. <laughs> you know, like, you know, Eric Swalwell. You know, like, who cares, right? I mean, seriously, like, my guess is that his mother is going, what? <laughs> You're running for president? Come on, Eric. What about your, what about your friend Cory Booker? Listen, Booker, Booker has a puncher's chance and in, in the boxing vernacular, which means that he's got charisma. And it hasn't shown itself yet to get traction. But Booker can do things on a stage, and I've seen him do it, where he can really persuade people. So Booker would be one of those guys who I would say, don't count him out. Because he gets on that stage in the debates, he has a few good moments, he's confident, because he's, listen, his confidence is hurting right now. I don't know that, but I know, because I've been a candidate and I watch. And you know he's not getting the reaction he was hoping to get. So you start questioning yourself. And he needs to have a few good moments. So if you were one of the 24 and you knew that Biden was the insurmountable object, what would you do to try to move him aside in the I debates coming up? I wouldn't do anything in these first debates. If, if you come out too hot in these first debates, you're going to look desperate. Now, some of them are desperate and should be desperate. And they're not going to be in the second or the third debate. But I'm talking about the people who actually have a shot here. Bernie, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Amy Klobuchar. You know, some of the people who I think have some talent. Um, I, my advice then would be, don't go after old Uncle Joe too fast. Because Uncle Joe may kill himself. Right now, we've watched two Joe Biden presidential campaigns before, and they were not sterling examples of discipline. 
And we've seen him now in the last couple of weeks say some things where charitably you could say he's kind of put his foot in his mouth. Biden has the capacity to do that. My strategy, if I were one of those who have money, have organization, and have a credible case to make to be the nominee, not Julian Castro, right? Somebody who really could actually be the nominee. I'd lay back a little bit. I'd try to sell myself and wait. Because if Biden makes a mistake, he's done. He's not Trump, where Trump could do almost anything and it didn't matter, right? I mean, I, I'll tell you this story about the way you view people. When Trump made the comment about John McCain, the first one, right, early in the campaign when he said, you know, I, I, I don't like people who get captured. I like people who don't get captured, right? I was at Hyde, been at that Iowa event the day before. I flew home. My campaign manager calls me, reads me the quote. I'm like, he's dead. You can't say that about the guy who's in the Hanoi Hilton for five and a half years. Like, no, he's, it's over. And I'm saying to Mary Pat, it's done. Trump's done. Good. He's out. That's one out of the way, right? <laughs> then, my, then my phone rings, and it's Jeb Bush. And Jeb's like, listen, you, saw, you heard the McCain thing? I said, I did. He goes, listen, he's done. It's going to come down to me and you. And he said, so let's just make a commitment to each other that we'll do this in a way that's civilized and smart, and we'll have a good debate um, you know, over the next number of months. And whoever wins, wins. I'm like, yeah, okay, sounds good. Um, <laughs> but like, it was like a blip. Like Trump was like, Trump not only didn't apologize, he doubled down. Damn right he's not a hero. Like, oh, I can't believe this, right? <laughs> Biden won't get that break because Biden's a politician. See, Trump got the break because people said, you can't blame him for that. He's not a politician. He didn't know any better. He's Trump. He says shit. Who cares? He's going to stir things up, though, isn't he? Right? Biden, they're going to go, you've been in politics since you were 29 years old. You're now 77. You know you're not supposed to say stuff like that. You're out. So I would lay back if I were, you know, the second tier. I'd lay back, see how Biden plays it. Biden is going to commit to this debate thinking they're coming after him. He's going to be prepared for them coming after him. And he's going to be a little jittery about it. Because you can't help but be jittery when 20, 30 million people are watching you and you think you're going to be the object of all the, the attack. So let's, if I were them, I'd let them play it out a little bit. There's plenty of time. It's only June. There's plenty of time to lay the wood to Joe Biden if you want to um, and see what the result's going to be. Let me, we're going to go to questions in a minute. But let me ask you this. You bring up McCain, and, it, and it's interesting. And, and We've talked about this a, a lot uh, in the past, and, and, it, and, it, and I'm saying this very sincerely. I, uh, I mean, we, I, I like many of the things you did in New Jersey. We've had you, a you like me, Jeff. What? I'm not going to go that far. He does. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not he swiping does. right or whatever that is. On, on you. But he uh, does. it's okay. No, 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 no. I don't like you that much. But I, I like you. I like you on a personal level because we like the same things. We're bridge and tunnel guys, and that's the way it is. But yep. uh, no. But I've seen you do. I, I've seen you do interesting things in New Jersey. Uh, I've seen you. Uh, look, you've had your bumps. I'm not going to discuss the George Washington Bridge, but you've had your bumps. Um, you, that's a nice drive by. It was Go ahead. Little, yeah. Keep going. I know. You could take it, though. You could take it. That's right. Uh, and I think about you in the same way I think about uh, Marco Rubio in, in this case, Lindsey Graham, certainly. The, the, the way in which, and this is a very sincere question, mm -hmm. the way in which people bent toward uh, the ruler, you know, like you, you know, you know that Donald Trump is in many ways uniquely unfit to be president in the United States. Where, Anyways, and, where is and the question? The question is coming. Just wait, wait. It's my, yeah. The question, the question is, I think the surprise in this country, the question, just look at me for a second. I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting. The question is, the question is that Donald Trump is not that surprising. He's a television reality TV star. It's fine. The question is, how many Republicans bent to the will of a leader who shows authoritarian tendencies? Well, uh, what does that say about our democracy? What does that say about all these what people? What does it say about our democracy? It says he won. 
And when you win, you get to be president. That doesn't frighten you at all. Jeff, you're the one who's living in perpetual fear. No, I'm not scared. I'm sorry. I believe in our democracy. I believe in the firmness and the vitality of our democracy. And I absolutely believe that whether it's four years or eight years, America will survive if you Donald are, Trump. If you are still wait a, a U.S. attorney no, right no, no, now. No, 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 wait a second. If you are a U.S. attorney no, 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 right no, no, now, we're not going on to another topic. On the FBI, you asked me a question. You, I'm going to give you I'm the just, answer. I'm telling no, you. No, Jeff, I'm not going there. My point to you is you asked a very important question. Republicans agree with much of the policy prescriptions that he's putting forward. And therefore, they are bending to the policy, not to the personality. And many of us have said publicly, many of us have said publicly, that when he says things, when he tweets things, when he does those things, that it's unacceptable. When he tweeted the thing about Charlottesville, I was in Sicily on vacation, and I sent out a tweet saying that's unacceptable. Okay, so we're not bending to the authoritarian ruler. We are saying, we agree with many, not all, but many of the policy pursuits that he is putting forward. And we agree with them more than we agree with Medicare for all. We agree with them more than we agree with the Green New Deal. Now, there's Green New Dealers in here, I'm sure. There's Medicare for all people in here, I'm sure. And you know what? That's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. And Democrats put up with some horrific behavior from Bill Clinton and bent to the ruler and didn't vote, not one of them, vote to impeach him or to discipline him despite what he did because they agreed with what he was doing as president. That's the way the system works. And so I'm not laying in bed at night, staring at the ceiling going, oh my God, Jefferson, Madison, where's our democracy gonna go? I'm not, we'll be fine. I'm the country is stronger than any one person. If you are still a U.S. attorney, if, if, you are, if you are still a U.S. attorney and you saw the attacks on Mueller and his investigation, if you saw the attacks on the Attorney General and the Justice Department, if you saw the attacks on the FBI, would you have the same reaction? What reaction? The reaction of it's going to be fine. It's all good. Jefferson Wait a second. Madison. You can have two reactions at the same time. You're a rule of law Hold guy. on. You can have two reactions at the same time. You don't have to wonder what I would have thought. I said it at the time. I told, I said publicly that he should never call it a witch hunt. I stood up and said Bob Mueller is a good, decent, honorable man who I thought would run an honest investigation, and I think he did. And I think the proof is in the pudding in that report that he did run. And I've said that publicly over and over again. I defended Chris Ray and the work that he's done at the FBI to reform the FBI because the FBI needs some reforming. And I think we're going to learn more about that. And I stood up even for an incompetent attorney general in Jeff Sessions because even someone as incompetent as Jeff Sessions didn't deserve to be beaten in public like he was. Done. Am I, am I worried about the democracy because of any of that? I am not. Because what we saw all throughout this was Mueller's an example of the strength of the democracy. Who appointed Bob Mueller? Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States who was appointed by Donald Trump. If there was some grand conspiracy going on here, there never would have been a Bob Mueller. And Rod Rosenstein would have said, no, I don't think there's anything here, see you later. And Republicans controlled Congress at the time and nothing would have happened. The strength of our democracy is in the people of this country, including someone like Rod, who when he saw that said, you know what? The right thing to do for the country is to appoint someone independently who will look at this and do it in an honest, straightforward way. And not only did he have the guts to do something that he knew the president wasn't gonna like, but he also appointed someone who is a stone cold killer. Bob Mueller is a stone cold killer as a prosecutor, and he appointed him. So that, I think, proves my point about the fact that our democracy is much stronger and much more vital than any one person. And are that's you, why I don't um, lay awake at night. Are you um, right now planning on voting for Trump in 2020? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, right now, yeah, I'm planning to vote for Trump are in 2020. Are there any Democrats who interest you at all? Well, I, I'm, I'm interested in the whole process. And I will watch all the debates, and I will judge all the candidates, and in the end, I will vote again for the person who I think is the best of what's left. 
and, and, and it'll be Trump or somebody else, and we'll see what happens. But I, do I expect to vote for the president? I absolutely expect to vote for the president, not just because it's him. In fact, predominantly because I believe that the policy prescriptions he will advocate in the 2020 campaign will be more in line with my philosophical thinking than whoever the Democrat is. Maybe I'll be, maybe I'll be surprised. If I am, I always have an open mind. But the bottom line is, you know, if you ask me today, which you just did, who are you voting for in 2020? I'm voting for Trump. Um, do we have mic runners? We can't. Do we have mic we'll runners? Put some uh, mics I, on. We, we can't. We can't see uh, out here. So Maybe raise your hand, or if a mic runner just brings a mic to somebody. Oh, there we are. There's a mic. There's a person right here. And I'll, I'll ask you to keep your questions in the form of a question, if possible. My question is: Do you see a case as a prosecutor for obstruction of justice? I don't. And what about all the cases, the trials that are going on in Congress, or the searches? Well, I, listen, Congress has an oversight responsibility and authority, and they should exercise that responsibility and authority as they see fit. Um, so I have no problem with what Congress is doing, um, and the President's going to have to respond the way the President wants to respond, and I suspect that much of it will wind up being fought out in the courts as to what's valid and what isn't, and that's, again, the strength and beauty of our system. It's not going to be one person who gets to decide. Congress is going to do what they do, the President's going to do what he wants to do, and then we have courts that can resolve the disputes. And no, there is no case for obstruction of justice, and let me tell you two reasons why as a prosecutor. Reason number one is there's no underlying crime. Bob Mueller determined that there was no underlying crime. Do I think there, he absolutely did. There was no, the, the obstruction of the investigation was an investigation of Russia, and Russian collusion, conspiracy with the Trump campaign. Mueller definitively found that there was no conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russia. And not only the Trump campaign, he found definitively there's no conspiracy between any American and the Russian operatives who were trying to affect our election. So you can't obstruct an investigation into a crime that turns out not to be a crime. Secondly, were there attempts to obstruct by the president? That could be argued. But what happened was people didn't execute on his, on his directives. So he tells Don McGahn, Mueller's got to go. Don McGahn goes, uh-huh, and then leaves the office and doesn't do it. And let me tell you something. That's not unusual. It's not unusual for that to happen with staff. And Henry Kissinger told me a great story that when he finally understood the full depth of Watergate, that he went to a prominent Washington wise man from the Truman administration, and he said, please tell me, how could something like this have happened? He said, oh, Henry, it's easy. Some dumb son of a bitch went into the Oval Office and did as he was told. You're President, comparing Trump to Nixon, by the way. Of course I am. And by the way, Trump's compared himself to Nixon by saying he didn't fire all those people because he saw Nixon do it and it didn't work out too well for him. <laughs> Trump just said that last week, right? So this is comforting? Listen, what, if you let me finish, I let you finish. executives all the time, governors, presidents, get angry, feel like they're being wronged, wronged by the Congress, wronged by the media, wronged by other political actors, and they blow off steam. You know what we should do to this guy? We should do this. We should do that. And good staff, smart staff, which Don McGahn was, say, okay, when he comes to me the fourth time on this, then I'm going to have something to worry about. And that happens at every ex senior executive position whether it's president or whether it's the governors, and you hope that they have good staff. The difference between Trump and Nixon was Nixon didn't have a Don McGahn. He had John Dean, who now portrays himself as some saint. But John Dean coordinated the cover-up, took bribes to pay to the witnesses to keep them quiet. Don McGahn, when he was told to do something like that, said, you know, not doing it. That's the difference, and that's why there's no obstruction. There's attempts, but there's no obstruction. Um, hi, Governor Christie. Hey. I heard you mention earlier that um, there was no point doing an investigation to these uh, um, allegations of sexual assault against Donald Trump because there's no way he could be prosecuted. But what I remember is around about six months ago when Justice Kavanaugh was nominated to the Supreme Court, the Republicans in the Senate decided it was worth having the FBI investigate because it was such an important position that the people deciding whether or not he should be there should have a right to know. So if this person two is totally running, different situations because please explain. Thanks. two totally different situations because they had to not get voted on Kavanaugh. 
They wanted that information as a basis for deciding whether to vote to confirm him to the Supreme Court or not. The the, the, listen, that's, the, that's not, it's, there's no you know, macro investigative unit that investigates for you to decide your vote. The Congress has a constitutional authority and responsibility to advise and consent on nominations to the Supreme Court. They then could appropriately ask the FBI to investigate and provide them with information so that they can acquit their constitutional responsibility. There is no such analog to the, to the thing that you just brought up on the sexual assaults. In the end, you know who's going to look into it? The media is going to look into it. And you know how you're going to be informed? By what the media uncovers. In the very same way that you only found out about this woman this week because she went to a media outlet and finally told her story and they published it. That's the way you'll find out to inform your vote in 2020. You don't believe me, everybody. You don't want to give more power to the government. You want to set up some super investigative authority that any time the person in the White House or some person in Congress is morally offended by something, they can call on the super investigative power to come in and make a judgment? God forbid in this country we ever have something like that because our freedoms will go down the toilet because you'll be dependent upon then the decision of who's morally offended by a particular action or not. And we know that in our country there are any number of moral issues where people in good faith completely disagree. And I don't think we want to start giving some super investigator an opportunity to just go off on a frolicking detour um, to ruin someone's reputation, um, whether it's the witness you know, or the accused. There's a question back there. Thank you, and uh, thank you guys both for being here. Um, Governor, in your uh, evaluation of the Democratic field, I noticed that you used the vernacular entirely of showmanship and almost nothing on the substance. And it strikes me that it's deeply unfortunate that that's the case. Um, so I wondered first if you would agree that it is unfortunate that we are evaluating the election entirely on showmanship. That's, that's all and we can do. Wait a second. No, no, let me, we're let we're me, not evaluating. No, let, 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 let me finish the question. question. Let me finish the question. So, Please. one, I want to hear why you disagree. But <laughs> if you didn't disagree, or if you don't disagree, um, you guys respond to us. So what should we be doing differently in our evaluation of you? Well, um, first, on the first question, that's the way we're evaluating it now, because nothing has happened yet. There are tiny, substantive things that are being thrown out there, proposals that are being thrown out, phrases are being thrown out. Medicare for all, Green New Deal. Um, today, Bernie Sanders, abolish all you know, uh, student debt. Um, those are just ideas. That isn't substance. Substance is how you're paying for that, and that, and that, and that. And why is that good for our country? We'll get to that eventually. And people will have, will, but in the end, to answer your second question, I think the biggest problem politically in our country right now is that people are demanding absolutism. If I don't agree with you on everything, you're not voting for me. No. Up, oh, he's pro-life. I'm pro-choice. To hell with it. I'm not voting for him. Up, oh, they believe in fossil fuels. I believe in green energy. I'm not voting for him. Well, let me tell you, everybody, that's how you wind up in the, in the polarized situation we're in. Everybody in their own corner. I watch Fox News. You watch MSNBC. And no one watches CNN. It's like that's, <laughs> right? You want to talk about a drive-by. Right. That was pretty good. That's just, and is, so what do you need to do differently? You need to show as voters a willingness to allow people to be honest. Because if the criteria is I only get, because you're right, politicians answer to you, and by the way, politicians only become successful politicians if you vote for them. So if in fact you want us to compromise, then vote for people with a record of compromising. If you want people to listen to the other side, Vote for people with a record of listening to the other side. That would not include Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. They reversing, were, neither one of them would have been nominated. Reversing the gerrymandering that has turned districts into these polarized outposts. It would be a huge, a huge plus. So you're, you're for a reversal of gerrymandering that oh, might absolutely. actually hurt Republican short-term chances. Of course I am, because what's happened is that in congressional races, House races in particular, 
what's happening is you don't worry any longer about the general election. All you worry about is the primary. So if you're a Republican district, all you worry about is a challenge from your right. So you keep moving further right. If you're in a Democratic district, you keep moving further left because all you're worried about is a primary challenge. No one worries about the general election anymore except in about 70 districts out of 435. About 70 districts are the ones that determine control of Congress every two years. So I'm absolutely against gerrymandering. I think it's toxic to our political system. And, and I think it needs, to be, it needs to be eradicated. And the Supreme Court's gonna have a couple of opportunities to do that, um, both in this term and, and I think in the next term, if they take the cases. And I, that, I think, is, would contribute to this. But what you need to do, you need to start voting for people who actually have done what you say you want done, even if they disagree with you on a few things. You know, I mean, Ronald Reagan, I think, said it really well. The person who agrees with me 80% of the time is not my 20% enemy. He's my 80% friend. And we're not doing that anymore in this country. If you don't agree with me on everything, I'm not watching you, I'm not listening to you, and I'm sure as hell not voting for you. And, and that, and by the way, politicians listen. They've heard you. Okay, run to the extreme. And moderate Republican governors? Like, you know, you, you know, who appoint Muslim judges or who, you know, or who, or who extend, you know, um, extend in-state tuition to, um, you know, dreamers. I mean, I got pilloried on that stuff in a Republican primary. But a majority of people in the country actually agree with that. But where are you? You're holding your breath and sitting it out because it's too distasteful. You think this is too distasteful. You keep sitting it out and not doing that stuff, it's gonna get even more distasteful. So, you know, that's what we need to do. Um, and, and that's what voters need to do. And they'll reward that. Politicians will respond to that. Why? Because we wanna win. Now we'll respond to it. Uh, there's a question, young man on, up, up here. Do we have time for one or two more? If you just raise your hand so we get the mic. To, okay, we'll go there next. Are there any women who wanna answer questions? Can we try to get, look, yeah. I, do you think or feel that there is a viable political future for, to use your term, moderate Republicans? Sure. And I think there's a viable, um, a viable path in the future for moderate Democrats, too. You wouldn't know it by looking at today with either one. But we go through cycles. We go through cycles in this country. We always have. And, and so, you know, I, I believe that, that, you know, People asked for so long, will we ever have an African-American president? And we had Jesse Jackson run, and we had Shirley Chisholm run. And the problem wasn't that they were black. It was that they were the wrong candidate. And when the right candidate came along, somebody who could appeal to a broad spectrum of voters, he won twice. And I think the same thing about philosophical issues. The candidate has to sell it. Because people are not paying 100% attention to this. You got lives to run, families to raise, businesses to run, jobs to do. You're not gonna be paying attention to every word we say. So we have an obligation to highlight the things that we think are important. And so I do think there's a future for it. And I'm just not, I'm an optimistic person. I'm just not one of these despondent people who go, oh my God, you know, the country is falling apart. Let me tell you, man, there is not, a place in this world where there aren't people who want to come here. And there's a reason for that. And it's not just economic. And so I believe we've got the greatest thing going in the whole world. It doesn't mean it can't be better and that we don't want it to be better, it should be better. So I think there is a path for those folks, but we got to sell it. You're pro-immigration. Yeah and you support a president who says the country's all filled up, no more room. Yeah, we disagree on that. How many things can you disagree with him on before you actually choose a Democrat to vote for? No, 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 well, you, no, well, because, Ed, Jeff, that's really pithy, but I don't, I don't agree with universal, I, I agree, I don't, actually. I don't, I don't agree with universal health care. I don't agree with the Green New Deal. I don't agree with forgiving every bit of student debt in this country, and to me, if I, and those are just three off the top of my head. 
And if I went through an entire list of things, I disagree with the, demo the generalized democratic philosophy more than I disagree with Trump as he's expressing these, expressing these things now. So that's it. That's, but th and guess what? That's my right to make that evaluation. I might be wrong, but I have the right to be wrong. And so do you. That's part of what this country is all about. You know, I, I watch, I, I love being in front of audiences like this because as I look out at people, I can tell the people who are listening and the people who aren't, right? And that's the problem in our country. I did a speech in San Francisco. And I said, I think the, I think the tax reform is a good thing. And this woman started hissing me, <laughs> like literally hissing. And I ignored it the first time. And then I said, I think deregulation is a good thing in general. She started hissing more. And I looked at her and I said, you know what? You're the problem in this country. You're the problem, not me. I'm just up here expressing my opinions, which by the way are opinions that are held by lots of people. You disagree with it, obviously. Stand up and ask a question, or just sit there quietly and disagree while I'm in the middle of talking. Right? And then when there's a Q&A period afterwards, tell me you think I'm full of it, and tell me why. We're personalizing all this, and, the, and this is one of the things that I disagree with the president the most. It's his personalization of every disagreement. We can have disagreements that are not personal, that don't make you a bad guy or make me a bad guy. We just don't agree. And I think when I sit in front of audiences like this one, I want to get to a point where everybody listens, where you're not like going, oh, God, why did I get this ticket? You know, and like, <laughs> I don't agree with anything this guy said. What the hell, right? No, we got to listen to each other. And then we can feel free to disagree. The founders developed this country to be a disagreement. The Constitution is written in a way that creates conflict. They wanted that because they thought that's the way to keep a democracy vital. Three branches of government, all with different powers, overlapping powers. And the people in the middle of that creating the mayhem they'll create by who the hell they're going to vote for and send into those positions. America's an argument, but it's, it's, it becomes personal, really personal. Like, if you think this, you're bad. And I think what I think, so I'm good. That's a much greater threat to the country than Donald Trump or anybody who sits in the Oval Office. And so we've got to try to listen to each other. And, if, and, and when we disagree, we disagree, and then we move on to the next topic. Well, I'm going to uh, uh, take the... There's uh, a woman who had a question. I'm assuming that they're turning the lights off because the I drone wants care. the ballroom they're, back. They're not paying wanna, me to be here. Let's go. All right. You're going to get the last question. I mean, like you bring up, does the woman have a question? Then the woman raises her hand. You go, oh, well, good night, oh, everybody. No, 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 no. Do not. Thank God. Do not. Thank God oh, there's a conservative oh, oh, here oh, who respects oh, women and was not going to end this event this without having a woman. This is pure demagoguery now. Thank you, ma'am. Now, now destroy me. Come on, let's do it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hit him hard, please. Thank you. I'm Ann McNulty from Short Hills, New Jersey. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so following up in Jeff's question about immigration, as you know, we have many strong immigrant communities in New Jersey many of whom are now terrorized by imminent raids, what they're afraid of imminent raids from immigration, um, from ICE, ICE. So I'm just curious what your position is, whether or not you call them concentration camps, not so much about the camps in general, but specifically about immigration policy. Well, the, 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 the family separation policy was completely wrong-headed and, and just the, the wrong thing to do. And that's what happens when you hire a stupid attorney general, okay? Because he, he set the policy. Now, the president permitted it, but he set it. And he set it in a way where he didn't explain completely to anybody that we didn't have enough holding cells, we didn't have enough lawyers, we didn't have enough judges to be able to process something like that in a reasonable period of time. That's his job to do. On immigration in general, I've always said that I believe that you've got to give people an opportunity, people who are here, an opportunity 
to become legal status. I'm not so sure about citizenship, given the numbers we have now. But I don't think people should be lurking around in the shadows, worrying about the things you're talking about them worrying about. And that's why, when I was governor, I did things like you know, extend in-state tuition to dreamers. Because these are kids who got brought here not at their own will. And we've now, in New Jersey, paid to educate them from K to 12. So now we're going to say, we paid to educate you from K to 12. But the college thing, yeah, we got to make it harder for you. It made no sense to me. We've already made the investment in them. So let's continue to make, the, make that investment easier for them by giving them in-state tuition. Um, you know, those are things that we can and should do. I think on the bigger question of immigration policy broadly, this is one of those issues that is the best example of what I talked about in the last answer which is everybody's absolute. You know, on the Democratic side, if it's not a path to citizenship, forget it. On the Republican side, if it's not, you know, kicking them out of the country, forget it. I said during when I was running for president, the idea that we're going to deport all the people who came here illegally, you would start to line the buses up end to end in Seattle, and they would get to between San Diego and Los Angeles. That's the number of buses you would need to bus these people out. It's not practical. But, but I do also understand that if we do that, if we provide a path to legal status for folks, we've got to start enforcing our border in a better way. It is unfair to the people who are standing in line in countries all over the world dying to get here and then when they come here, I have to wait for legal status and wait for citizenship. It is unfair to them to allow people to come up over the southern border with impunity when they pay coyotes to do it for them. And then to say, OK, well, you know what? We did a lousy job, so you can stay and you've got legal status. We have to pay for the lousy job we've done over the last 30 years since Reagan signed the last immigration law. We have to pay the price for that. But part of paying that price has to be setting up an enforceable border on our southern border so that immigration can be done in a, in a way that's fair. Because right now, you know, if, if you're in Poland and you want to come to the United States, you can't just walk here. But if you're in Guatemala, you can. It's a long walk. But they're doing it as we speak. So we need to put some fundamental fairness into this. And I think we've got to stop having the argument we've been having over the last 30 years about how we got here. Guess what? We're here. Whatever number of people you want to say it is, 10 million, 12 million, 15 million, whatever it is, we're here. And more importantly, they're here. The last part of this would be, you know, immigrants in this country have built this country. Okay? You know, my grandfather was born on the boat between Sicily and the United States. And when he arrived at Ellis Island, they made him an American. And he was very, very proud of that. Very proud of that. And, but he came to Ellis Island. His parents waited for the ticket legally to come. And then he helped to build as a mason, all, so many of the buildings that still stand in the city of Newark, where he immigrated to. And so I think the only way to get by this is to elect a leader, ultimately, who is going to say, I am not going to continue the argument of the last 30 years. We need to have a new conversation. And both, I'm willing to stop the argument if both sides are willing to give. But both sides have to be willing to give on this. And if they're not, we're going to, be, we're going to have this problem at 18 million or 20 million six years from now, right? So that's the way I feel about it. And, and, I, and I, I don't think that the rhetoric on both sides is helpful. It's just not a constructive argument to have in the manner we're having it right now. It's the same thing we were talking before. I believe what I believe, so I'm good, and you believe what you believe, so you're bad. I don't believe that's true about the Republicans or the Democrats. And I think they've put themselves in those corners. 
and we've got to give them permission to get out. Someone's got to give them permission to get out, and I hope that we do. So, Governor Christie, um, I want to issue an official invitation right now Ooh. for the 2024 Aspen Ideas Festival. Please come and launch your presidential campaign. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not sure quite which party you're going to be running for by the, by the <laughs> with nomination in 2024, but you're more than welcome to come back anytime. We, we love having you here. We're very appreciative that you engage in this conversation, and it's good to have you. All right.